the Bible translators have done their very best uh, not to give you the idea of what that word means. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm reminded of one of my favorite movies, uh, uh, The Princess Bride, in which uh, one, one member of the cast keeps saying, inconceivable, uh, when something that's obviously conceivable has just happened. And finally, one of the other characters says, I don't think that word means what you think it means. Um, this word means what you think it means, <laughs> in spite of the fact that we continue to translate it as servant. Uh, the New American Standard uh, uses bond servant pretty consistently, which kind of connects it with what it really is. Uh, you are in bonds as you serve, and so you're not free to leave. Uh, but really, it's slave, and we are called to be slaves. Uh, if you're an American, I assume everybody here is, uh, we have a long history with slavery. We've already made that decision. We know how we feel about slavery, and we have no intention of being slaves or of enslaving people, and uh, that's just something that we want to avoid, and yet here we are called to be slaves. So we're going to go through that today. Get comfortable with it. Be aware of the, uh, the, the fact that uh, uh, we're called to be slaves, but we are not called to a life that is characterized by human slavery. Um, there, there are some uh, marvelous uh, parts of being a Christian slave that help us out. I've had a couple of hands here. Uh, go ahead, Ben, and then down to Steve. I was going to say our concept of slavery is way different than probably what the Bible teaches. The slavery of the Bible is you are an indentured servant mm -hmm. or someone who is bound to an ideal mm -hmm. or a concept mm -hmm. and rather than someone who is basically traded as money. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and we'll, we'll get some into that, although our language continues to fail us. An indentured servant can serve out his servitude and, and be unindentured at that point. Uh, a true slave is physically, literally, economically owned uh, by the slaveholders. Steve had a comment, uh, Dennis. Uh, so, um, but, but uh, Ben's comment is, is absolutely on task. The, the idea here is we are slaves, but we are slaves in a radically different way from how uh, earthly slaves operate. Steve, go ahead. Those were, uh, there were in the Old Testament those slaves that decided, I want to stay mm -hmm. in this household, and they put their head up against it, <clears throat> dug a hole in their ear or something uh -huh. like that. Yeah. That's, yeah. That was volu that was Voluntary volu servitude, yeah. Uh, and uh, that's, that's in large part what we're talking about, uh, and it's a great biblical model. Uh, one more, Dennis. We've got a comment down in front here. Go ahead and raise your hand so he knows. There you go. And thank you for using the microphone. I'm, not all of us are comfortable with mics, but uh, we have YouTube audiences that, uh, that can't hear what you say unless you say it into that. I think parents are slaves to their children, <laughs> but it is love connected, yes. so it feels differently than Absolutely. that. And that's kind of the way we are. We have chosen to do this, and it's through love. So exactly. it's not real true. Exactly. So in three comments, we've covered everything I was going to cover, so now we can all go home. Yeah. Anyway, uh, let's proceed. Uh, slaves in the New Testament, uh, it's a commonly used word. Uh, the word is doulos. Uh, we don't really have any, any words that we have stolen from that other than some fairly academic words. Uh, New American Standard consistently translates it as bond servant, which is closer than servant. Uh, New Revised Standard, NIV, the vast majority, King James, uh, American Standard, uh, the, the vast majority of the English translations will translate this as servant. And when we think of a servant, we tend to think of Downton Abbey and the downstairs people, and they're all well-dressed, and they're pretty well-treated. Uh, they can leave if they have uh, economic alternatives. Uh, that's, a, that's a whole different ballgame, and yet servant is is what we end up uh, translating the bulk of that. As a consequence, we're going to go to no less an authority than Gerhard Kittel, who has a like 14-volume 
uh, Greek dictionary, and uh, he, he has uh, oh, about 20 pages uh, on the word doulos. But the important part here is doulos indicates a service which is not a matter of choice for the one who renders it, uh, which he has to perform whether he likes or not, because he is subject as a slave to an alien will, that is, to the will of his owner. Uh, and in the, in the New Testament time, to be a slave was probably even worse than America's uh, uh, history with slavery, um, in, in that there, it was assumed, it was just assumed that you were going to use this person until you have used this person up. They, if, if, they, if they died uh, because of something you had them do, that was kind of par for the course. Uh, and so in going into uh, slavery, you went into it assuming that it was going to be a death sentence. It was not for everyone, uh, but that was well within the power of the slave owner to just say, you're, you're, you're gonna do this until you die from doing this. And that's completely legal, it is completely expected, society makes no judgment about it. Uh, in the first century, uh, being a slave was not a good thing, and thousands upon thousands of people uh, became slaves, obviously involuntarily, because they happened to be on the wrong side of a war, uh, or they ended up in, um, a, 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 in a political situation where they were on the outs with the power people, uh, and you could end up in slavery. It was very difficult to get out of slavery once you were into it. So it really was a life sentence, and it tended to be a fairly short uh, life sentence. Uh, so the, the key concept here, we'll get to you in a minute. Um, the key concept is um, the involuntary nature of it. Uh, you don't go into it saying, I'm going to try this out, and if it doesn't work, then I'm going to go do something else you no longer have control over what you're going to do. So, um, slaves in the New Testament. Simeon, the prophet, when um, Jesus' parents uh, bring him in uh, for his, uh, his temple ordination, uh, Simeon, the prophet, takes Jesus, the, the infant, into his arms, uh, blessed God. Yeah, we're down to 10% here. Ignore the man behind the curtain. Um, uh, blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant, your doulos, uh, to depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. So uh, this, is, this is a man who would have been held in high regard socially uh, in, the, in the world of Jerusalem, which was kind of its own little world, uh, and yet he calls himself when speaking to God, uh, his slave, his, his doulos. And so um, uh, that kind of sets the tone. Here's somebody who, who has social power, probably some economic power, certainly some religious power in that structure, uh, and yet he, he has taken on the role uh, of God's slave. Uh, the church, uh, post-Pentecost, uh, faces its first persecution, for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, uh, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats, the people outside who are threatening the church, and grant that your bondservants may speak, to your, may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. This is a fascinating text because you have servant appearing twice referring to Jesus, and then you have bond servant, that's our word doulos, uh, occurring once. Thank you. Uh, and uh, and that, that applies to us, to the Christians that are populating the, the first century church. Here. The word uh, servant that's applied to Jesus is a completely different word. Uh, it can also be translated child, uh, and it implies um, or carries with it the meaning of a relationship which causes one to serve because of the nature of the relationship, uh, not because you are bound to serve 
Uh, and so it's a, that's a completely different word. It ends up, though, a little confusing. Your servant Jesus, uh, and then do this for your bondservants. Uh, it's, they're, they're radically different words with radically different meanings. Uh, even though Jesus is going to characterize himself as a doulos, as a slave, he's not only going to characterize himself, but he's going to end up taking the most menial task that can be afforded to the lowest slave in the household, and he's going to gather his disciples together, and what's he going to do for them in the late John? He's going to wash their feet. Yeah, not a, not a happy job. Uh, he says, if I, being your Lord and teacher, and I am, uh, have washed your feet, then you are going to wash each other's feet. That's really the foundation of this concept here. So, uh, moving along, 2 Corinthians, Paul uh, talks about himself as a slave to, uh, to the Corinthian Christians. Uh, we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slave for Jesus' sake. Now, uh, the church at Corinth, uh, well-behaved, smooth-running machine, growing, doing all those good things the churches should do, and yet here is Paul... Uh, I'm, I'm being facetious for those of you who didn't, <laughs> didn't catch that. The, the Corinthian church, if you're going to be the slave to a church, Corinth probably not your first choice. And yet Paul says, I have made myself your slave. I have put myself in bondage to you because of the gospel of Jesus Christ that has called me into this relationship with you, whether you deserve it or not, and clearly you don't. Um, Philippians, uh, now I'm, I'm switching to the... New Revised uh, Standard, which goes back and forth. Probably 90% of the time, New Revised will translate doulos as servant. Uh, not even bond servant, just servant. But once in a while, they'll slip over and they'll use slave when it's particularly uh, useful. Uh, and this, this one, the familiar passage, and this is where they choose to use slave. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God... Did not, require, uh, did not regard uh, equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and then Paul goes on to describe uh, what else uh, Jesus does uh, when he pitches his tent uh, in the middle of our neighborhood, uh, using John's language. Uh, he takes on the form of a slave, and he takes on the function of a slave, and surely... If our Lord and Savior, without whom we would be, uh, how, how does Paul put it, uh, uh, most to be pitied and, and just completely out of relationship, uh, if, if he takes on the role of the slave, then how could we possibly turn that down? It turns out it's not a bad gig uh, after all. Second Timothy, Paul's writing to uh, young Timothy uh, about his relation with Christians. As the Lord's servant, once again, this is doulos, must not be quarrelsome, but kindly to everyone, an apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with gentleness. So being a slave in the New Testament context is not a matter of waiting for orders. <laughs> you have your orders already because your master, while it may appear to be the people with whom you are working and with whom you are related, your master is ultimately the one who gives the orders uh, that would be your Lord and Savior. Okay? He puts you in these positions, and then you serve other people because you are serving him. And uh, that's going to come into play here, too. Lots of slaves in the Revelation, all kinds of slaves. And there's a, there's a beautiful irony uh, all through the Revelation having to do with slaves. Uh, this is... Uh, the, the first couple of verses of the Revelation. The Revelation of Jesus Christ, notice this is not the Revelation of John, okay? John doesn't do the revealing, he's just the guy who's taken it all down. The Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bond servants, there's our word, the things which must soon take place, and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant, same word, John, who testifies to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Word comes from God through the angel to Jesus to give to John, or Jesus may actually be the angel. That's a lowercase a uh, use of the word. And uh, the, the point is there's, there's two slaves here. 
John is the initial recipient of all of this, and as, as a part of his slave duty, he is going to then communicate this to the seven churches of Asia, all of whom are also slaves to God. So, um, <clears throat> so that's, that's kind of the first reference, right in the very first two verses. A um, couple of references in the letters to the, to the seven churches, I have this against you. Um, you uh, tolerate the woman Jezebel, who called herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my slaves, my bondservants, astray, so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So once again, Christians characterized as slaves, as bondservants in the New American Standard. Another reference, and here's where we start to see the weird situation, the, the unearthly situation that Christian slaves find themselves in. I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God, and he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it had been granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the doulos, the, the douloi rather, the, the slaves, the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And we heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And he goes on to name the tribes in a very unusual uh, naming process. Um, but the point is, uh, here are the slaves. Here are the people who should not have any rights uh, and who should not think of themselves as having any rights. And yet God is sealing them. He's protecting them. He's walling them off from the things that are going to happen uh, to the rest of the world. And so these are slaves who are protected uh, by their master. And uh, that's an important concept that we're going to uh, tuck away and, and continue to use. We get to the 11th chapter, which is kind of the hinge point um, for the entire book. The, uh, the seventh trumpet has sounded. The, kingdom of, uh, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. He will reign forever and ever. And the worship response to that is, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations were enraged, quoting from the second psalm. Uh, your wrath came, the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. Take a look at who the bondservants are, okay? We are the saints, okay? And everyone who preceded us and who will follow us, should the Lord choose not to return uh, today or in the near future, we are all slaves. But look who we get lumped in with. The prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, and then just to make sure that we all feel included, because I'm not nearly as good a saint, you know, as some of you are, the small and the great. Isn't that wonderful? You can be not just a slave in the church, but a small slave, somebody that nobody ever notices. You're just kind of working around the background, doing whatever comes to you and not making a big deal about it. And you are included in this text. The, the, the range from prophets, whom we tend to think of as being, you know, pretty heavyweight type Christians and, and people who, who feel strongly and who do great things, all the way from the prophets, all the way out to everybody great and small. This is comforting for me. <laughs> As many times as I've bumped into walls and tripped over furniture, spiritually speaking, uh, this is a comfort to me. Let's go ahead and take a couple of, of comments here. I think Ben was first and then Larry. I was going to say the idea of slave that you were talking about when it's a servant and you have no choice. Mm -hmm. Sin is that slavery. Mm -hmm. Yet God purchased us out of that into a slavery. And so you, you have to talk about the masters. Satan mm -hmm. being a master of evil and wanting to literally destroy you and destroy your life. Uh -huh. With God, it's, he's, he knows what you're capable of, mm -hmm. and he will not send you into something that would destroy you, take you back into sin, mm -hmm. but make you a better person. And if you die in this physical life, it's not the end. 
Mm -hmm. Good. That's good Pauline thought. Uh, it's even such good thought that Bob Dylan wrote a song about that. You got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you. Uh, that's as good as my Dylan gets. Uh, but yeah, he, it's, it's, you, you got a choice. You can be a slave or you can be a slave, but ultimately you can be a slave. Stu Larry, then we have a comment down front. Well, just an observation I've made over the years, and that is we tend to look at these things, and even like in Revelation here, you're talking about mm -hmm. as something that happened a long time ago. <laughs> it's hard for us to relate to what was actually going on because mm -hmm. we separate ourselves by time when really we should not be doing that. Absolutely. It's, it's difficult to not do it. Yeah. Yeah, we tend to think of people in the first century church as being uh, folks who are completely different, uh, completely different in their experience and their circumstances. And to, a, to an extent that's true, the culture of that time and the economics of that time are, are pretty different from our culture and our economics today. At the same time, they're no better Christians or no worse Christians than we are. They're kind of all in that same group and great or small, we all get lumped into the same protection and the same uh, call to service. Go ahead. I, I was just thinking here, you kind of bailed me out there when you the great and the small, <laughs> we give things. Sometimes I'm working and banging my hand. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Uh, that doesn't come out. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of bailed me out there. There you go. Say. Yes. He give thanks to the great and the small. That's right. That's right. And the and the uh, the the opportunity to be bathed in grace is a is a wonderful thing. That imagine a slave going to his master and asking for grace because he didn't quite get the job done. That's just, that's foreign, but that's the essence of our slave to master relationship. Terry, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to mention that uh, Hugo McCord in his translation mm -hmm. of the New Testament always uses slave yes. instead of servant. Yeah. When it's coming, when it's talking about our relationship to Jesus in that 18th verse in, in uh, Revelation 11. Uh -huh. It says, the uh, down at the part you're talking about, for you, to, the time has come for the dead to be judged and for you to reward your slaves, uh -huh. the prophets, the saints, and those who reverence your name, the small and the great, mm -hmm. and destroy those who destroy the earth. And mm -hmm. Hugo McCord is known... <laughs> Pretty much, even worldwide, maybe as yeah. as a Greek scholar who mm -hmm. really uh, wants to stick with the original language exactly. and make sure things are are uh, translated correctly, and he yeah. tr he always translated that as slave rather yes. than servant. Yeah, yeah. You could always count on uh, on Hugo to uh, to call something by its, by its most direct, most meaningful name. Uh, John is not John the Baptist, he is John the Baptizer, because that's closer to what the, the, uh, the descriptive word there is. And, uh, and yeah, uh, and uh, Brother Hugo was not the only translator uh, to stick with slave. Uh, Eugene Peterson, in his, trans his thought translation, The Message, uh, uses slave almost... Uh, uh, almost completely consistently that I saw. Uh, and there, there are some other translations that, that will stick with slave. Most of us want it laundered a little bit before we read it, so we'd, we'd prefer to think of ourselves as servants. Until we're done with this lesson, at which point all of you are going to be intensely comfortable with being slaves. Moving on, uh, at the end of the Revelation, this, the, these next two are just fascinating to me. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. That's the new Jer the Jerusalem that has come down out of heaven. And his bondservants, his slaves, his douloi will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There's a, there's a, a lovely kind of, we're not sure what that means. Is his name on their foreheads because he owns them? He does. And that would not be out of the realm for the owner of a slave to mark the slave in some way as being his property. 
but at the same time, what a glorious life to live with the name of your God uh, indelibly imprinted such that everyone who looks at you says, I know who he is. <laughs> he belongs to God. Okay? So that's beautiful. And then take a look at the next one. There will be no longer any night. They will have no need for light of a lamp or the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them. And they, that's the slaves, that's us, they will reign forever and ever. When was the last time you read a story in which the slaves end up reigning as authority figures in their social structure? Joseph would be about as close as I think we can get out of, uh, and, and, and he's a, he is a slave in, in this sense, but he always seems to be self-directed in spite of the fact that he's not just a slave, he's a, he's a, a great slave. He's a slave that causes his, his owners to, to promote him and to, to give him more responsibility, and yet he always seems to be directed here. Here's God, the slave owner, saying, not only am I going to protect you, not only am I going to give you meaningful work to do, uh, not only am I going to put your name, uh, put my name on your forehead, but you are ultimately going to reign as co-regents with your elder brother and savior, Jesus, on the throne over the entire world. This is just this is completely outside of what the world thinks of when the world thinks of being a slave. Uh, and it's, it's appropriate that we take a completely different look at what this means. And we'll continue uh, with this in a moment. Let me do my summary, and then we'll have one more comment. Uh, the summary of slaves in the Revelation, God's people are his slaves. Okay, No question about that. The word is used consistently. And, uh, and it's descriptive of, of God's people's roles. We are in the revelation and in, uh, in general life, we are powerless against the forces of evil. How many times have you wished that you could do something about a situation that is characterized by evil and you find that, well, you know, there isn't much we can do. We can pray, that's always good, and we believe that prayer is powerful, but what we really want to do <laughs> is we really, we really want to grab the keys to the car and go somewhere and do something, and that's not our role as servants, as slaves. Um, so we're powerless against the forces of evil, but we are protected consistently by God from the forces of evil, and as the ultimate irony, uh, we will reign forever and ever. Isn't it wonderful to have the sounds of little children in our midst? Um, I am blessed. I am blessed by this. Let's go to a comment. Uh, ben, go ahead. I was going to say there is an interesting way that that was read, that we will be marked with God. Uh -huh. At this point in this time, if we were to see God, we would physically be destroyed simply because of the imperfection that we are. Mm -hmm. At that point, in God's in presence, we are in a way made like God and mm -hmm. therefore we shine with God's light that mm -hmm. would be a mark that mm -hmm. in that second part was read that we will be illuminated because we're in God's presence exactly exactly without without benefit of externals just our relationship with God is illuminating for us Dennis if you want to go back and catch brother Bob there that'd be great one more comment and then we're going to kind of transition uh, into what it means to be a slave in the 21st century. In Go the ahead. time of the Roman Empire, it, uh, a person considered to have the mark uh, on his forehead mm -hmm. would indicate his acceptance of particular doctrine, and on his hands would be uh, the work life of individuals supporting a cause, whether it was Mark of the Beast or it was, it was uh, God Almighty and the Lamb of God. Indeed. And Proverbs has something uh, to bear uh, on this concerning the slave. I'm reading from verse um, 21 of chapter 30. It says, for three things the earth is perturbed or disturbed. Yes, for four it cannot bear up, for a servant when he reigns, and etc. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, Bob's point is well taken. Um, you, in, in the Revelation, everyone gets a mark, okay? Those who are God's slaves 
uh, get his mark on their forehead. Those who serve the, uh, the worldly powers, the systems of evil, get a completely different mark that has some numeric consequences to it. But everybody gets marked. You have to choose a side. Uh, our culture is made up and seems to be dominated by people who are agnostic about all of this. Well, I haven't decided. I'm kind of going back and forth. If you want to believe what you want to believe, that's okay with me. Live and let live. I'm not marked. Yeah, actually you are. <laughs> You've made your decision by not making a decision. So, uh, good observation. Let's move on uh, from this idea of all of the New Testament uh, times when the, the word slave is applied to uh, Christians. Now, what does it mean to be a slave in the New Testament sense, and uh, particularly in the sense of the New Testament church? Uh, the, the idea of, of slavery in the New Testament is always a mutual thing. Uh, I can't just go to Bob and just say, I'm sorry, Bob, but you've got to do this for me because you're my slave, right? The essence of the, our relationship is that I am his slave at the same time as he is mine. And so for me to go in and start giving orders is completely inappropriate. I'm not the master. I am the slave. And so this becomes another of these exercises in one anotherness uh, that is so beautiful and that is so powerful in shaping us according to the things that we should be doing if we're not already. So, John 3, 4, 13, 14, which we quoted from earlier, uh, Jesus saying to his disciples after he's washed their feet, if I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you ought to also to wash one another's feet, the ultimate in mutual slavery. Uh, he goes on later to say, I'm giving you a new commandment. You love one another even as I have loved you. You love one another. And if we are, in, in fact, doing that one another love, uh, we're pretty much home free. If, if we've figured out how to love one another, we've probably figured out the whole slavery uh, business. And then uh, Romans, Paul's talking to uh, Christians he hasn't met yet. Uh, and he's, he's describing the body, just as we have many members in one body and the members do not have the same function, so that we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. If I, as, as Brother Lee was talking about earlier, if I just whacked my thumb with a hammer, is it only my thumb that hurts? <laughs> Depends on how hard you hit it <laughs> as to how far up your arm and maybe all the way across your chest it hurts, but the whole body hurts when one member is, is damaged. And that really should be descriptive of our whole body here. Paul certainly wants the Roman church to think of itself as one body with many members, and when one member's out of whack, it throws the whole body out of whack. And when mo one member is in good uh, parallel working, uh, working all toward the same goals as, as those of the entire body, then the body works better. And that's really what our relationship is to be about. Romans 12, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, give preference to one another in honor. Uh, that refers to a system that we don't have as much of today, although we certainly do uh, have some situations in which uh, somebody is socially higher than somebody else and so therefore gets recognition that this other person doesn't. Uh, in, the, in the Roman world, uh, there was a very clear pecking order, and the arrangement around the table uh, was evidence of that pecking order. And uh, Jesus gives a parable about a guy who comes in and sits too high up in the table, and he is, somebody says, I'm sorry, that's not your chair. You get to go down there at the foot. And he talks about how embarrassing that would be. And then likewise, the, the person who comes in sits near the foot of the table, and, the, and the, uh, the, the person who's arranging these things says, no, 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 no. You need to be up here in the place of honor. And that's what this is all about. This pecking order is completely flattened out in the New Testament church. And so we are to give preference to one another in honor. We are to honor one another you take the highest position. Oh, no, you take the highest position. You, know, you deserve the highest position. We should be constantly giving one another honor uh, for these things. 
Romans 15, we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those who, uh, without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. There's that word that we keep seeing, the building up, the building of a, of a strong and, and able to withstand the forces of nature uh, edifice. Uh, even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Uh, <clears throat> continuing uh, that passage, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another, the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Do we have enough marching orders there? Has Paul given us enough stuff to work on there? All of these one another texts really should be normative. They should be shaping our responses uh, to each other on a very practical level. Uh, this is not just, uh, yeah, theoretically, this is, this is how we should treat each other. It should be obvious from people who are walking in the door, how well we treat each other because we are uh, uh, members of one another and together members of the one body. Uh, First Corinthians, uh, so then my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. The Corinthian were, some of them were wealthy, others of them were uh, impoverished. The wealthy ones would bring all kinds of, of food and just eat it themselves. Uh, if you didn't arrive on time because you were somebody else's slave and they hadn't released you yet, then you came in late and you missed not just the Lord's Supper, uh, but the opportunity to have food shared with you. Uh, and Paul says, you know, that's not really one another. That's, that's not what we have in mind, okay? So uh, that you will not come together for judgment. This is important stuff. God is saying this is, this is part of what you will be judged on when you get to the judgment seat. Galatians 5, you were called to freedom. This is a lovely text. Uh, the, the churches in Galatia were being tempted to go back to the Jewish system. And Paul is saying, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And then he holds up this idea of being free. You're free from all of that. You don't have to do those things anymore. There are good reasons for you not to do those things anymore because you have been freed, you have been liberated not the language of slavery, is it? That's, that's kind of the opposite of what we would expect. And yet, you are called for freedom, brethren. Do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Because we have been freed, we have been freed to be one another's slaves, and we serve one another because of that freedom. Uh, further in Galatians, even if anyone is uh, uh, caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So these people are tempted to go back to the law of Moses, and he says, better you should Focus your efforts on fulfilling the law of Christ. Enjoy your freedom. Do not misuse your freedom. Use your freedom instead to serve one another. And by serving one another, you fulfill the law of Christ. Further in Ephesians, more Pauline writing, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another. There's that term again. In psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, even the Father, and be subject one to another in the fear of Christ. You know, we, we get this lofty language that Paul is talking about, the wonderful things that happen when we sing together, as we're going to in a few minutes. And then he says, and by doing that, you are being subject to one another. Um, major, major stuff. Uh, be filled with this, and, and this is only one, these are only a few of, of multiple, multiple one another uh, texts. Uh, if you want an exercise in humility, 
uh, sit down with your uh, concordance, if you still have a concordance, if you're with your computer otherwise, and just type in one another and take a look at all of those texts uh, in the New Testament, particularly outside the Gospels. Uh, just about every time you get those two words together, one another, uh, you got some instruction and you got some challenge. You got some things uh, that we want to be doing better. Uh, it's such a common theme rates more in uh, rates more attention. So summarizing, we are a church of slaves. We are slaves to God and to Christ. We are slaves to each other because we are slaves to God and Christ. And then this thing that throws us out of that realm of slavery and into this special realm of being uh, slaves that enjoy our slavery. We are victorious slaves. Uh, we, are, we are not defeated by being a slave. We are, in fact, empowered by being slaves. We're slaves because we have been freed. So uh, next week, we're going to do the church as covenant community. And after that week, we're going to get into some more practical type stuff. What happens to the church in particular, uh, uh, particular environments? Uh, how does the church respond to a really positive environment? How does the church respond to a really negative environment? We'll do a couple of weeks on that, and then we'll wrap this up uh, in, the, in the last couple of weeks of the quarter. Final comments, we've got about two minutes. Dennis still has the microphone. Judy, way down in front. Dennis, oh, you have a question. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. At least you gave me some time to make up an answer. Um, this should have been done at the first of the lesson, but you were talking about the different slaves, bond servant, servant, mm -hmm. slave. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of like Abraham that sent his servant to find mm -hmm. a wife, that servant would have been his um, heir. Yes. So was he a different? That is an excellent question, question, and there is a whole sociological study <laughs> that would be involved in, uh, in answering that question. Uh, the, the question is, uh, do the household servants that have such huge responsibilities, and in Abraham's case, would have been his heir, uh, is that still a slave? And the answer is yes and no. Uh, those people would have been slaves in that they came into that household as property. But as they worked themselves up to levels of higher responsibility, they cross over uh, out of the term. I, th I think the, the Hebrew term, which I don't even know, uh, for slave, uh, would still be applicable to them. But there is another Hebrew term that turns into uh, the Greek term that we then translate, transliterated into English, uh, diakonos, uh, which sounds a lot like deacon and is deacon. Uh, where you are a servant, but you are, a, you are an administrative servant. You're somebody who gets things done and who, who gets, acquires resources and does what needs to be done. There's a, there's a point at which a slave crosses into that uh, realm of service that requires responsibility, requires a certain amount of brains, uh, requires some, some get up and get it done uh, type thought process. You can be a lazy slave or you can be uh, a busy, uh, effective slave, and the more effective you are, the more likely you are to rise into that area of, of being in the diaconate, of, of being a deacon. One more quick one, and then we got to wrap up. We're a little over time. So we're born into slavery when uh -huh. we are baptized. Mm -hmm. So we are a part of the family. Mm -hmm. Uh, unfortunately, those people that work as slaves are not part of the family yeah. uh, unless they have been brought into the family mm -hmm. as we have through baptism. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the relationship between earthly slaves and their earthly masters and heavenly slaves and the heavenly master is a radically different relationship. Uh, did we have another comment? Because we're, we're completely out of time. Make it real fast. Oh, I was... Larry kind of covered it, but okay. I think this slave that talking about with Abraham, they there's a point where a slave becomes part of the family, really, because literally he's trusted, and yeah. they know that he's going to to that he cares about them, not just because yeah. he has to do what they say, but because he's part of their family, and that's what this one who is going to to pick a wife. 
absolutely. things like that. They they become someone that Abraham would have been comfortable having mm-hmm. him be his heir because he knew that he knew him. Yeah, absolutely. Probably known him yeah. for years and years and years. Absolutely. And knew that he could trust him. Yep. In the Roman world, the highest form of praise that an owner could give a slave is to free him. And, uh, and that happened a great deal where the, the slave would continue to work for the owner, but no longer as slave and owner, now as freedman, um, more of a, of a deacon-type uh, operation. We're out of time. Let's pray quickly. Father, we thank you that you have called us to be slaves, that you have not uh, enslaved us in a way that is onerous or, or weighs us down, and certainly not in a way that kills us, but rather in a way that gives us life, in a way that frees us, and ultimately in a way that allows us to reign over your kingdom. We praise you for that. Thank you for this time. Through your son that we pray. Amen. Thank you.